He has come to speak to us on C.S. Lewis's voice to the 21st century. It is a rare treat to have him in America doing this. So would you join me in welcoming him? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's a huge pleasure to be here in Houston, and I apologize for the change in accent. Um, <laughs> I think C.S. Lewis would be very surprised if we knew that so many of us were meeting tonight to talk about him 50 years after his death here in the United States. Because, you know, he, he, I think he'd be astonished and thrilled that he still resonates with people all these years after his death. What I want to do is to talk to you a little bit about my biography of Lewis and then why it is that this man still speaks to us so powerfully today. But let me tell you how I encountered C.S. Lewis first. I was quite an aggressive atheist when I was a young man. In fact, uh, when I sort of read the writings of Richard Dawkins, I get all nostalgic because, you know, I used to be like that myself. And... <laughs> And then I went up to Oxford and I discovered Christianity, and that was a massive change for me. And as I began to explore my faith, people said to me, you know, you should read C.S. Lewis. He used to be an atheist. He became a Christian. He might be helpful. And so in 1974, I began to read him, and I've read him ever since. And you know, the more I read him, the more I get out of him. And so what I want to do tonight is to talk about some of the things I've found and also why I think he's still a voice for the 21st century. So here is C.S. Lewis. You know that picture very, very well. And what I want to ask is, what's new about this biography? Well, there's a picture you may not have seen before. That's C.S. Lewis, top right-hand side, and a group of Oxford undergraduates in the year 1917. It's a very significant time for Lewis. He's just arrived at Oxford, and immediately he's going into military training because the First World War is on, and Lewis is of conscription age. He's going to have to go into battle. So it's a very significant photograph indeed. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. So what is new about this biography? Well, I think there are a number of things. One, of course, is that there's new evidence about Lewis himself. And then, of course, there's a lot of stuff we already know about Lewis. And what I try and do is see if there's any way in which we can make more sense of it. In other words, there's some new evidence about Lewis. There's also new ways of interpreting things we already knew about him. So let me give you some examples of each of them. One of the issues that you come across in Lewis is that he develops this very close friendship with J.R.R. Tolkien, the man who wrote The Lord of the Rings. And in fact, in many ways, Lewis was midwife to that massive book by Tolkien. Lewis encouraged Tolkien to keep writing those three volumes when he seemed to give up simply through exhaustion or lack of focus. And the two men were really close throughout the 40s and early 50s. And then something happened, and they began to fall apart. And scholars have always thought that it was Tolkien who moved away from Lewis rather than the other way around. Well, we found a letter from Lewis to the Nobel Prize Committee dated January 1961, which proposes Tolkien for the Nobel Prize in Literature. And you know, I think that says to us, even though things had gone wrong, Lewis retained his respect and his admiration for Tolkien right to the end. So that's one thing. Another thing is this. You remember that picture I showed you of Lewis at Oxford? He was there in training in an Oxford University uh, cadet corps, and he was training to go into the British Army. And he joined the Somerset Light Infantry. And most biographies say, well, yes, Lewis joined the Somerset Light Infantry, and off he went to France. But this puzzled me. Why? Why join the Somerset Light Infantry? If any of you have visited England, you'll know Somerset is a lovely place. But why, why would Lewis want to join that regiment? Why not join an Irish regiment? What made him choose that regiment? And then I found an answer. While in training at Oxford, Lewis shared a room with Paddy Moore, a man his own age 
who had moved to Oxford with his mother and his sister, and they basically became very close friends. They offered to look after each other's parents if for any reason they died in the war. And that friendship was clearly very, very close and very significant for Lewis. And what I'm showing you now is a photograph of a document talking about Paddy Moore by his full name, the third name down, Moore EMC. And what I want you to notice is what is pasted against his name on the left-hand side of the screen. We all know that Paddy Moore joined the Rifle Brigade and was killed in battle in March 1918. But this document shows his sponsoring regiment was the Somerset Light Infantry. In other words, Moore thought he was going into that regiment, and it looks as if Lewis asked if he could go there as well to be with his best friend as they went into battle together. So there are lots of little areas where I think we cast light on Lewis. But of course, there are also ways of looking at stuff we already knew and seeing if we could make sense of it in new ways. And one of the things the biography looks at is the date of Lewis's conversion. There's a superb passage in Surprised by Joy, which talks about Lewis being the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. He got down on his knees and admitted that God is God, and Lewis himself dates that to the Trinity term of 1929. In other words, sometime in April, May, June, 1929. As Mark Lanier mentioned, I read everything Lewis wrote in chronological order, and as I did so, I began to sense something was wrong. To put it very crudely, nothing seemed to have happened in 1929. I think it happened a year later, and I'm going to tell you why. First of all, Lewis's father died in September 1929. His mother had died back in 1908, and if this was the case, then Lewis would have been a Christian between about three and five months when his father died. What is interesting is that there is no reference to God at all in Lewis's correspondence with his close friends about his father's death. Yet I thought, well, you know, if you, if you come to belief in God, then that affects things like death. Why is there no reference to God in Lewis's reflections on his father's death? And I began to wonder, what if Lewis's father's death was not something Lewis interpreted in the light of a belief in God, but was actually something that made Lewis think about God instead? Secondly, when reading Lewis's letters and everything else, there's no tone change. There's no change in mood in his correspondence of 1929 or early 1930. And if Lewis did begin to believe in God, then you'd expect something to be there. But there's nothing, not even in his letters to his close friends. A further point which I think is really important is Lewis was actually pretty lousy with dates. In 1941, Lewis, who was a fellow of Magdalen College, was made vice president of the college. And one of the key responsibilities was booking rooms for events. And within three weeks, chaos was ensuing. Rooms were not booked at all, or they were double booked. And the real problem simply was Lewis couldn't remember dates at all. Maybe he got this date wrong. But most interestingly of all, I think, in February 1930, Lewis writes a letter to his close friend, Owen Barfield. And the language in this letter resembles very closely Lewis's own language in his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, in which he talks about his feeling that God is drawing close to him, that he's not going to be able to resist God at all. Here's the letter. Lewis writes, terrible things are happening to me. 
The spirit or real eye is showing an alarming tendency to become much more personal and it's taking the offensive. It's behaving just like God. You better come by Monday or I'll have entered the monastery. <laughs> now, what's going on? If Lewis converted back in 1929, what's this all about? Barfield himself later said that letter marked the beginning of Lewis's conversion. And I think he's absolutely right, but note the date, February 1930. And then a further important point. Lewis tells us that when he started believing in God, he wanted to show the flag for his new belief. And he started going to his local church. He started going to college chapel. Now, there is a letter in which he talks about this. In October 1930, Lewis wrote to his close friend, Arthur Greaves, to tell him he changed his routine slightly. He now goes to bed earlier because he started going to morning chapel at Magdalen College. There's a new change here, and it doesn't make sense if Lewis converted back in the summer of 1929 unless he waited a year to start going to chapel, but it does make sense if he converted in the summer of 1930 and began going to chapel at the first available moment because Malden College Chapel closed down during the summer vacation. So I suggest that uh, there may well be a case for rethinking this. But some of you were saying, well, you know, so what? And I think we need to just uh, agree that it's not an earth-shattering event. Lewis was bad about dates, we already know that. And I think the re redating is interesting to historians and specialist Lewis scholars. But his, it doesn't really make much difference to anybody else. Because for most people, the point is that this atheist Lewis got converted, not exactly when he did get converted. Now, as Mark was saying, there's a lot of research behind this. But you know, a biography is about telling a story. You've got to maintain pace. You can't put too much information in because it slows it down. And therefore, I decided that it was a better idea to put some detailed research work in a second volume that will come out later this year. It'll come out in about four weeks. And basically, it looks at some of these things in much more detail. But it doesn't slow the biography down. I think that's the important point here. So our theme tonight is this. What does Lewis say to us today? It's a great theme, and what I want to do with you is explore some of the issues that Lewis engages, which remain important for us today. And when I began to read Lewis myself all those years ago, I think initially I found Lewis to be somebody who reassured me. He reassured me that Christianity made sense, that there were good reasons for being a Christian. He also challenged me to think more about my faith and take things further. And that, I think, continues to be an important aspect of Lewis's significance. In the title of my book, I refer to Lewis as a reluctant prophet, meaning by that he didn't really want to take front stage. He didn't really want to be somebody who spoke to his own nation and to many others about the Christian faith. But he believed, and I think rightly, that there were others who could do this much better than he could, but they weren't doing it. And therefore, he stepped into the gap and did it himself. He did it reluctantly, but I want to say to you, I think he also did it extremely well. And so in the remainder of this lecture, I'm going to talk about four themes I find in Lewis. There is much more that needs to be said, but to make this manageable, I'm just going to look at these themes, which I think are interesting and important, and explore them with you. So I want to begin with this really important theme for Lewis, the idea that Christianity gives us a big picture. And there's a quote from one of his essays of 1940. It's called, Is Theology Poetry? And he writes these words, 
I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only do I see it, but by it I see everything else. And his point is that Christianity gives us this way of looking at things, which helps them to come into focus. He gives us a panorama of reality and enables us to see what things are really like and where we fit into things as well. And for Lewis, the ability of the Christian faith to make sense of things is a very important reason for thinking that it is true. So let's follow through this idea. Lewis talks about the Christian faith being like a sun. And to begin with, we might say that this helps us to see further. You might think of a sunlit plain seen from a hilltop. The point is that as the sun rises and illuminates the landscape, you're able to see things that perhaps you didn't see before. The Christian faith helps us to see things properly. Paul talks to us in Romans 12 about not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewal of your minds. And in many ways, Lewis is echoing that, talking about the ability of the Christian faith to enable us to see things in a very different way. It allows us to see things which are otherwise in shadows. And Lewis uses the phrase shadowlands, You've all heard that, shadowlands, to really point out that there are points in our lives when we walk in relative darkness. But Lewis would say, first of all, that Christianity illuminates so much that it enables us to trust it for those areas where the illumination isn't as good as we would like. We have to walk by faith and not by sight. But even then, in the shadowlands, We are not on our own. God is there. Christ has been there. And that helps us to walk in hope. Or you might think of the image of a lens. It's about bringing things into focus. And certainly when I was an atheist, I used to look at things and say, these things, you know, they seem a bit fuzzy and blurred. They're a bit out of focus Is there any meaning to reality? Someone like Richard Dawkins would say there's no meaning at all. But Lewis suggests that maybe the reason we're not seeing things clearly, the reason we're missing something deeper, is that we're looking at things out of focus. And for Lewis, Christianity gives us a way of seeing things more clearly by bringing them into focus. We see things as They really are. We see nature as God's creation. We see ourselves and each of those around us as God's precious creatures for whom Christ died. Each of us bears God's image. We see things in a new way. And also, of course, Lewis emphasizes that this Christian way of looking at things is able to fit things in. Suffering. The sciences, our own experience, history, culture. Lewis is saying that Christianity is intellectually capacious and is able to make sense of all these things. Now, of course, there's more to Christianity than just making sense of things. Indeed, in my own walk of faith, I began by appreciating its ability to you know, make sense of things and then discovered it was rich emotionally, relationally, and imaginatively as well. But to begin with, that was really important for me. Lewis's close friend at Oxford, Austin Farrer, wrote these words about Lewis's book, The Problem of Pain. And I think it's very interesting and revealing. He wrote, Lewis makes us think we are listening to an argument, when in reality we are presented with a vision, and it's the vision that carries conviction. And what Lewis is saying is not so much, let me give you six arguments for saying this is right, but rather look at it this way. Doesn't that make more sense? Doesn't that say to you, maybe this is the right way of looking at things? 
And that, I think, is very characteristic of Lewis, and I think it's very important and helpful. Now, one of the areas that Lewis explores is usually called the argument from desire. And Lewis was an apologist. He saw himself not simply as reassuring Christians that their faith was well-grounded, but also of, of giving us arguments, ways of thinking that we can use in trying to explain our faith and persuade those outside the church that Christianity makes sense. And Lewis's argument from desire is an example of his, his presenting us with the vision of the Christian faith and making us realize how much sense it makes. There's a quote from Mere Christianity. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, let me try and explain. He's saying that most of us have this experience of longing for something that really satisfies, or this sense that there has to be more than what we know. There's something beyond us. And Lewis begins to argue like this. He argues that there's a sort of spiritual longing or a yearning within many, including atheists, that there's a sense of emptiness, a, a lack of fulfillment. And so we begin to ask questions like, is there something which, if we found it, would actually make sense of things and bring satisfaction and fulfillment to our lives? And then Lewis argues that Really, nothing in this world, nothing that is created or finite, seems able to satisfy the deepest longings of humanity. Because in reality, these are longings for God. And Lewis's argument is that this experience of longing, which is so difficult to satisfy, is really a longing for God, which we get muddled about and attach to something else. This is a quote from one of his earliest writings, a book called The Pilgrim's Regress, written shortly after his conversion, in which he talks about the, the thoughts he was having on his road to faith. Lewis writes, the human soul was made to enjoy some object that's never fully given, nay, cannot even be imagined as given, in our present mode of subjective and spatiotemporal experience. It's an early writing. The English is a little bit cumbersome, but you can see the point he's making. There is something we are meant to possess, to enjoy, and it's not something in this world. But our desires and longings help us realize that we are looking for something and that it is not to be found in this world. It lies beyond it. This is brought out clearly in what I think is one of Lewis's best writings, his 1941 sermon, The Weight of Glory. This was a sermon he preached at Oxford in 1941, and the title comes from John Donne, who spoke of the exceeding weight of divine glory. And in this sermon, Lewis explores this idea of desire. What he's saying is something like this. We think that this, for example, the quest for beauty, or a really important relationship, that this is going to satisfy us, that somehow this is the destination of our quest for meaning and truth. But in reality, it's a signpost pointing beyond itself. It's not the signpost we're looking for, it's what it points to. And he argues like this, the books or the music in which we thought beauty was located will betray us if we trust to them. It wasn't in them, it only came through them, and what came through them was longing. And so Lewis suggests that things that that create desire and longing, like beauty or the memory of our own past, these are good images 
of what we really desire. In other words, not what we desire, but echoes or hints of it. But if they are mistaken for the thing itself, they turn into dumb idols and break the hearts of their worshippers. So Lewis suggests they are not the thing itself. They're only the scent of a flower we haven't found, the echo of a tune we haven't heard, or news from a country we haven't visited. And you might like to think of those images. They're very, very visual. It's like going into a garden at night and the fragrance of a distant flower just begins to waft into the garden. And you know there's something there, but you can't work out where it's coming from. And Lewis is saying that there are many people who have this experience and are wondering what on earth it means. And Lewis is saying that one of the things that you and I can do is to help people to realize that Christianity makes sense of this longing and points towards the one who is able to satisfy, to fulfill these deepest yearnings and transform us. So Lewis ends this sermon by talking about his hope for transformation. At present, we're on the wrong side of the door. But, he says, the New Testament, the pages are wrestling with the rumor it will not always be like this. One day, God willing, we're going to get in. But I think Lewis's most important contribution really lies in the imagination, the importance of stories. And you know, we live in a very interesting time. We live in a world in which some people take a modern way of looking at things based more on reason, some in a more postmodern way, which emphasizes the importance of images, stories, and so on. And what is interesting is that Lewis speaks to both these groups of people. And indeed, one of the things he does is those who rightly believe that Christianity is rational, he says that's right, but it also is more than that. It's about something that engages and captures the imagination as well. And Lewis is very good on this. And of course, Lewis, as a younger man, realized how important the imagination was. He began to realize that his atheism, in effect, negated the rich imaginative life he had. But really, the important thing for the young Lewis was the importance of stories. Lewis's conversion to Christianity was partly about realizing that Christianity told what I'm going to describe as a grand story or a meta-narrative a story that made sense of things and appealed deeply to his imagination. It's a story of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. And Lewis saw this story as both being true, but also having imaginative power. So the point I want to make is that we need to see Narnia, perhaps as one of Lewis's best pieces of writing, and also one of his most profound in terms of helping us to think about who we are and why we matter. Now, I spend a lot of time in this biography talking about Narnia, and I have to organize the biography in a very special way to be able to do this. Why? Because Lewis wrote Narnia over a period of years, maybe as many as 10 years. And if you organize your biography on a year-by-year -year basis, 1945, I did this, 1946, I did this, and so on, then Narnia is spread out. What I did was to organize the biography around three worlds that Lewis inhabited. Two are real and physical. The third, for Lewis, was real but imaginative. And let me begin by making a distinction Lewis would want me to emphasize. Imaginary means something that is made up, invented. Imaginative is something that arises out of our mind, our deepest intuitions, and it's grounded in something deeper. 
It reflects the Christian doctrine of creation in which we are made in the image of God. So there's a lot about Narnia in this biography, how it came to be written, what it's like, and why it's so significant. So why did Lewis write Narnia? Well, here's one explanation. This is Elizabeth Anscombe, a philosopher, towards the end of her life. And she had a very famous debate with Lewis at the Socratic Club in Oxford in 1948. And Lewis had written the book Miracles, in which he argued that a purely naturalist approach to things, what you see is what you get, was inadequate. And Elizabeth Anscombe agreed. She thought it was inadequate, but she also thought Lewis's presentation of the argument was inadequate. So she sets about showing him how he could do rather better. And I think Lewis found this a little bit difficult. But A.N. Wilson argues that this apparent defeat caused Lewis to retreat from reasoned argument into a world of fantasy. That somehow he wrote Narnia because he'd given up belief in reason, or that Narnia was to be seen as a return to a childish world, as if C.S. Lewis was like a Peter Pan who never grew up. Now, Wilson's argument basically is that Lewis turned to writing Narnia because he gave up on reason. But I do need to say that the evidence just doesn't warrant this at all. Because first of all, Lewis saw reason and imagination as enriching each other. Lewis has no rashness in terms of limiting reality to what we can prove to be true by reason. And anyway, Lewis had already used fiction, imaginative fiction, to do Christian apologetics long before he met Elizabeth Anscombe. It's not about Lewis running away from reason. It's about Lewis realizing how he could supplement reason with an appeal to the imagination, to retelling the grand story, the grand narrative in his own way. And the point that Lewis is making is this. Stories help us to make sense of reality. You may have heard people say, we live in a story-shaped world. And Lewis argues that each of us has our own story. And once we begin to realize that our story is part of a bigger story, then it really helps us to see our own story in a new and more meaningful way. And Lewis emphasizes that discovering this bigger story amplifies our vision of who we are and why we matter. So Lewis in Narnia explores the importance of stories. And many of you will have read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and I think it's the best of the Narnia books, by the way, and I also think you should read it first before The Magician's Nephew. But those of you who've read it will know the four children enter Narnia, and they hear different stories about what this place is and where it came from. And they've got to try and work out which of these stories can be trusted, because they are different. For example, is Narnia really the realm of the White Witch? Or is she a usurper? whose power will be broken when the sons of Adam and daughters of Eve sit on the four thrones of Ker Paravel? Is Narnia really the realm of the mysterious and noble Aslan, whose return is expected at any time? So the point I'm making is that Lewis is saying the children encounter stories. Which one is right? And of course, as you will all know, they gradually begin to realize that the story of Aslan makes sense of what they observe. And more than that, that each of the individual stories about Narnia is part of this bigger story. There's the grand story which links together all the little stories. It makes sense of the riddles that the children see and experience around them. So why is that so important? Well, you and I are told different stories about 
this world. And you and I also have to make up our minds about which story we trust. Is this simply a world that came into existence by accident? Are we simply random products of a meaningless process? Or is this God's created world? Do each of us matter profoundly to God because we bear His image and He loves us so much He sent Christ to die for each of us? Those are two very different stories. Those stories are being told about our world and we know which one is right, and it's our job to try and help other people to grasp why the Christian story is a true, true, in other words, it's right, but also real. That is to say, it's able to take hold of us and change us and enable us to live in a new way. Now, Lewis' approach has been very successful, partly because of a shift in cultural mood, which gives a new emphasis to stories and to images. We're used to using arguments, and I'm not saying we give up an argument, but I am saying we need to think also of things like this. Try seeing it this way. Let me tell you a story about who we are and see if this helps you make sense of things. And of course, the telling of stories is very important. As you all know, there are many stories being told, Philip Pullman's Dark Materials trilogy, for example, which are profoundly anti-Christian. And maybe we need to give thought to how we are going to tell stories that captivate the imagination of our culture, that end up on bestseller lists. And there may be people here tonight who feel that they could write those books and change the way we think. And if that might be you, let me plant that seed in your mind because it needs to grow. So how do we apply Lewis? Well, how might we, for example, use him, use his approach of telling stories, of appealing to the imagination in dealing with objections people have about faith? So let's look at just one example to flesh this out. We're going to look at an objection which many of you will know, and it's this. You just believe in God because you need to. You've invented God to meet your needs. There isn't a God. You simply projected your own world onto an imaginary screen, and you call that God. You've just projected and there's nothing there at all. God is just a bigger version of things we know in this world, and this world is the only world. Now, I could give a reasoned argument against that, but I'm going to be very frank with you, it would be extremely dull. What I want to do instead is to show you how Lewis does this. And we're going to look at one of the books in Narnia because Lewis tells a story, and he allows us to use our imaginations to picture the scene and begin to realize that an argument that seemed so sophisticated actually isn't so sophisticated at all. So we're looking at the silver chair, and as many of you will know, this is set in a dark underground kingdom, the underworld, and above it, there is the world that we know, the Narnian world of skies and sun and trees and fresh air. And basically, a Narnian prince finds his way into the underworld. And he tries to persuade the white witch that this dark, dingy realm that she knows isn't actually the only world. There's something bigger and better and brighter that she needs to discover. So she says, well, tell me about this world. And he says, well, for a start, we have a thing called the sun in the sky. Now, there's no sun in the underworld, so the witch says, tell me more. And the prince says, the sun is like a lamp. I'm going to read the narrative, 
and just follow it through and listen to what Lewis does. This is a Narnian prince pointing to a lamp in the underworld. You see that lamp? It's round and yellow, and it gives light to the whole room and hangeth from the roof. Now, what we call the sun is like the lamp, only far greater and brighter. It gives light to the overworld, and it hangs in the sky. So the witch comes back very, very quickly. Ah, hangeth from what, my lord, asked the witch. And while they were all still thinking how they might answer her, she added with one of her soft silver laughs, you see, when you try to think out clearly what this sun must be, you can't tell me. You can only tell me it's like the lamp. Your sun is a dream, and there's nothing in the dream that wasn't copied from the lamp. The lamp is the real thing, the sun. It's just a tale, a children's story. Now, as we read that, you know, a little smile comes to our lips because it seems very sophisticated, but we all know there is a sun and that this argument, which seems to make so much sense, actually just isn't right. And that's Lewis's way of doing this. He says, look, once you see it this way, the force of the argument just begins to vanish. But the important point is the way in which Lewis tells stories and appeals to the imagination in helping us to engage with our culture and also, of course, to think through our own situation. The fourth point I want to look at is translation. And Lewis realized how important this was during the Second World War. We need to be able to translate the gospel message into terms that an audience can understand. We're coming up to Good Friday and Easter Day, and we're going to be using words like atonement, redemption, salvation. And we all know that these are very rich and important words, but they're words our culture doesn't necessarily understand. And so we have to explain, unpack, translate these ideas for the benefit of our audience. For example, St. Paul talks with great excitement in Romans 5 about being justified by faith. But if you talk to your friends about justification, they will mean something like this. Justification is giving an excuse for being late at work, or it's about things you do to the right-hand margin on your word processor. And my hunch is Paul didn't have that in mind. So the important thing is how do we translate? And Lewis is quite good on this. He had to be, because during the Second World War, Lewis began to speak to ground crews at Royal Air Force bases. He was used to speaking to Oxford students. He started to speak to young men who had left school at the age of 16 and didn't really understand big words at all. And Lewis had to discover how to express his ideas in terms that made sense to them. And he did it. That's one of the reasons why his broadcast talks over the BBC in the 1940s were so successful. They connected up with were people were. Let's look at him on the basis of an essay he wrote in 1945. We must learn the language of our audience. And let me say at the outset, it's no use laying down a priori, in other words, advance, what a plain man does and doesn't understand. You have to find out by experience. In other words, Lewis saying you need to listen to the way people use language, and then work out how to state the gospel using their language in ways that are going to connect up with them. You must, Lewis goes on, translate every bit of your theology into the vernacular. He means the cultural vernacular, street language, not the language of the church, which we understand but doesn't necessarily carry outside 
the church walls. And Lewis says this is very troublesome, but it's essential. It's also of the greatest service to your own thought. If you can't translate your own thoughts into uneducated language, your thoughts are confused, look at that last sentence. Par to translate is the test of having really understood your own meaning. And I find it very helpful to do this kind of thing, to take ideas I need to explain to my non-Christian friends, atonement, incarnation, resurrection, and work out how I would do that in non-Christian language. Or what stories would I tell to help connect up with my culture? Lewis is saying to us, it can be done. He did it, and we can still use his attempts, but Things have moved on, and we really need to be able to make sure the gospel continues to be explained and communicated in terms that connect up with our own situation. I'm coming to an end now, and we're coming up to Easter. And so I thought I'd just mention one thing linked to Easter, which relates to C.S. Lewis. This is Holy Trinity Church in Headington in Oxford. This is where C.S. Lewis attended church from his conversion until his death. And here is his gravestone. Uh, it was placed there by his brother who lived with him and died 10 years after his death. And I want you to notice the motto on the gravestone. Men must endure their going hence. It's not really a Christian affirmation of hope in the face of death. It's much more about a passive acceptance of the inevitability of death. So why that text? Well, many of you will know the answer. When Lewis's mother died in 1908, the Shakespearean calendar, in other words, a calendar with a Shakespeare quote for every day of the year, was open at that text on the day of her death. And Lewis's brother, Warney, thought it would be very appropriate to place it on his brother's tombstone to make that connection with his mother. But many of us would say, well, that's a lovely touch, but Lewis, I think, would use other language and speak more vibrantly of the Christian hope. So let me end with an extract from a letter that Lewis wrote to an American lady only a few months before his death when he knew he was dying. He said, We are like a seed waiting in the good earth, waiting to come up a flower in the gardener's good time, up into the real world, the real waking. I suppose that, from, that our whole present life, looked back on from there, will seem only a drowsy half-waking. We are here in the land of dreams, but cockcrow is coming. Easter, I think, reminds us of that hope which we shared with C.S. Lewis. One day we'll be there with him and we'll rejoice about that, I know. But in the meantime, my feeling is Lewis encourages us to take our faith seriously, challenges us to go more deeply into our faith invites us to be able to speak to our non-Christian friends and family about the reality of the gospel, and perhaps above all, to have that quiet confidence that the Christian faith is something that can be trusted and tells a story that can outdo any stories that this world can tell. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. A question, we'll have volunteers coming down the aisle. Uh, please feel free to write it down. Your book has a subtitle that C.S. Lewis is an eccentric genius and a reluctant prophet. What made you put that on the book title? Well, I think we, we may have touched on the reluctant prophet, but he really was a prophet, but he didn't want to do this because he felt others 
could do this better. In the case of the eccentric genius, again, he really was a genius, but he was eccentric in the proper sense of the word. He was displaced from the center. He never really fitted into Oxford academic culture. He wrote books that people actually read. He got on the radio. People listened to him. You know, this, this didn't go down well with his academic colleagues. And I think more than that, if you think about Lewis, he was a very significant Christian apologist. But he always did it as a layman from the margins, not at the heart of the Christian religious establishment, but rather simply as an ordinary Christian telling what he thought needed to be said to our culture. Okay, we've got a bunch of really good questions. And, and did the death of Lewis's wife cause him to doubt his faith? Did the, did the death of Lewis's wife, Joy Davidman, cause him to doubt his faith? It, it did, in the sense that he felt this is traumatic and I really need to, to explore everything. Lewis always felt that when you went through something very, very difficult, you should write down your emotions. That was the best way, he said, of dealing with it. And if you read A Grief Observed, which we think is the text of what Lewis wrote down, you'll see he's saying maybe this, maybe that, but he's simply exploring all the options, not because he doubts God, but because he doubts his own commitment to God. And in many ways, what you see in Lewis is someone who's saying, maybe it's this. Okay, I'll think about this. No, it's not. Maybe it's this. Okay, I think about this. No, it's not. And in the end, he begins to say, thinking about the suffering of Christ really brings a new significance to joy's suffering and death and also to the way I'll cope with it. So interesting, in the end, I think, Lewis's faith emerges as stronger, but he does doubt in the sense of query, think things through, but with the intention of emerging, having thought through every possibility. Okay, who is Malcolm in Lewis's great book, Letters to Malcolm? And are Malcolm's letters to Lewis available anywhere? Oh, I'm, I, under the pressure of the moment, I've forgotten who <laughs> Malcolm's name. <laughs> and the answer is that um, we, uh, we don't have, to my knowledge, um, Malcolm's letter to Lewis. I think Lewis really just used, um, almost used this as a, as a procedural method of talking about things he wanted to. Okay. And many would say, actually, those are some, include some of Lewis's finest thoughts. What would C.S. Lewis think about our current culture? I think he would perhaps turn to us and say, looking us straight in the eye, I told you this would happen. <laughs> <laughs> Do we know what influenced Lewis to write the screw tape letters? We know something of it. I mean, obviously, it's difficult to pin down exactly what the thought was. It may have been a particularly boring sermon that, in effect, made Lewis's mind wander. But certainly, uh, certainly, he just seemed to have had this thought. What if I explored Christian spirituality, the whole issue of temptation, not from the perspective of God, but from that of someone whose business it is to tempt. In other words, it's saying, let's see this in a completely different light. And the surprise is that Lewis actually gives a lot of very traditional spiritual advice, but he uses a framework which really takes you by surprise and makes it all the more easy to accept his advice. Okay, some really interesting questions. Um, do you have any ideas on why Lewis made the ruler of Narnia a woman? Well, um, uh, my colleague Ian Wilson does, but I, I think he's wrong on that. <laughs> I think, I think um, Lewis is sometimes critiqued for not giving women sufficiently high roles. I think it, it's fair to say that actually in Narnia, some of the major roles are taken by women. If there is a central character, I think it's actually Lucy. Um, is there any author alive today who could carry on Lewis's legacy of writing compelling fiction, nonfiction, and children's literature? I think there are writers who can do each of those things, but they are different writers. I think Lewis's genius was that he did all of them, and as a result, there was a certain degree of cross-fertilization, so that he did them particularly well. And that's one of the reasons why I think we, we can't really talk about a new C.S. Lewis. We can talk about people who are carrying on part 
of Lewis's legacy. But really, we need someone who's able to bring together reason and imagination, a deep immersion in the Christian faith and literature, and the ability not simply to analyze, but to synthesize as well. And again, if anyone is listening to this who thinks that might be them, well, there's a heavy weight on your shoulders. <laughs> Has C.S. Lewis's intellectual legacy done us any notable disservices? That's a very perceptive question, and I think that perhaps one of the things that worries me, and this is a personal worry, and others who like Lewis may not share this concern, is that Lewis very often offers such good answers that we generate the expectation that we ought to be able to resolve questions like that. And I think actually we do need to be able to live with unanswered questions. And I think Lewis at some points does make that clear. But the problem is that very often he's giving these answers which are really, really rather good. And it creates the impression that for every question there is a good answer. And I think that reality is a bit more rough and complex than that. If we could digress for a moment from Lewis, a general question. What is the condition of Christianity in England? Um, it's an intensive care, I suppose. Um, we, 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 we need your prayers, and uh, we also need a new C.S. Lewis, and we need lots of other things. I think the real problem is that um, we have been taken by surprise by very rapid secularization, and it, it really means that Christian churches haven't really had time to think through how they should adapt to a new situation. There are a lot of encouraging signs, but there are also a lot of real challenges. So uh, I think we'd all want you to pray for wisdom for our churches and our leaders as we try and engage this very radically changed culture, because very often we're bringing old answers to new questions, and actually the mismatch does show up. Do any of your works address your transition from the hard sciences to theology philosophy? If not, could you speak briefly about that shift? I talk briefly about this in some of my works, but I think, simply put, um, I got converted during my first year at Oxford, and I was studying chemistry. And I then went on to do a, a doctorate in, in a, a sort of more biological field. And it was very, very clear to me that I wanted to be able to relate my faith to what I was doing. And I began to realize that, that while C.S. Lewis was very, very good, I needed to do things more rigorously, so I started studying Christian theology. And really it was this pursuit of a discipleship of the mind. I felt I had to sort things out to give myself good answers and also, hopefully, to begin to develop good answers I could share with other people. How did Lewis's Platonism influence his view of Christianity? I think Lewis is Platonist in a number of ways. And uh, if you could go back to that quote I gave you from the silver chair, there, there is this underground kingdom, there's this overworld, and in some way, the underworld has some kind of hint of the overworld. Now, Plato develops a, that analogy, and he uses it to make a very similar point. The question is, to what extent does Lewis's interest in Plato shape his theology? I think it does shape it in a number of ways. I think it helps us understand why Lewis is preoccupied with questions of knowledge and secondarily with questions of salvation. Secondly, I think it also means that he does tend to, um, he does tend to think in terms of very visual imagery, like... Um, like we see things that are copies or images of what is eternal. I'm not saying this is dangerous. I'm saying that we need to provide a more robustly biblical foundation to make sure we don't end up thinking simply of a sort of spiritual world somewhere up there and our world down here. When you read The Last Battle, there's this vision of a future transformed world, and there Lewis, I think, really does bring the biblical vision of the last things, of the hope of heaven, into focus much more clearly. Um, did Lewis continue his studies of Nordic myth after his conversion, at least if you know? Uh, and do you know whether that might have influenced his stories at all? 
I think we know that Lewis continued thinking about Nordic myths for a very long time. And it's very hard not to see how, you know, Lewis's knowledge of myths, particularly Nordic myths, might shape his, his fiction. Although I privately think that when I read Narnia, I see an awful lot of um, medieval stuff, uh, which came from Lewis's professional calling as a medievalist. For example, if you read um, um, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there's a lot about maypoles, there's a lot about battles on medieval scenes, a lot of chiv chivalry, the castles are medieval castles. So he, he, he draws richly on a variety of influences. Do we have any idea between Lewis and Tolkien, their greatest theological point of contention well, there were a number of points at which they were in contention. And I guess one of the questions would be, what counts as theological? But interestingly, one of the real issues that divided them was marriage. Uh, Lewis, I think, saw this as, as primarily a contractual arrangement. Uh, Tolkien saw it as something much, much deeper, you know, endowed with a sacred significance, and did not like what he thought was Lewis's rather casual attitude, for example, to civil marriage. Speaking of which, David, if you'd hand me that, I got texted an, an email question for you, uh, <laughs> and, and it fits right in with what you've just answered. Um, uh, one of the, this is being simulcast on the internet, and one of the internet uh, people watching asked the following. The one quirky thing about Lewis's theology, in my mind, was his acceptance of Anglican tradition of viewing sacraments as vital to salvation. That soteriology always seemed to me to be the kind of thing Lewis would have rejected. I know he had a taste for mystery and mysticism. I've always wondered whether any of his writings reveal any hesitation or change in his viewpoint. Thank you for this lecture, Tom. Well, Tom, I think that um, as I read Lewis, uh, I, I would have to disagree with those who describe him as being a high church Anglican. I just don't see that. I think Lewis brought his low church Anglicanism with him from Ireland, and that meant he was rather suspicious of liturgy, and also it meant he preferred to attend a service of the word rather than a sacramental service. He would go to communion as a special occasion, but he would normally go to morning prayer. So I, I, I'd want to say I'm not sure Lewis really invests very heavily in sacramental theology. There are points in his writings where he articulates something very, very close to sacramental theology, particularly when in, in his study of English literature in the 17th century, he's trying to, trying to account for some ideas we find in, for example, Richard Hooker. But I'm not sure he really buys into what I would loosely call a sacramental view of things. He does, however emphasize the importance of signs and actions. And you could argue that if taken in a certain direction, that becomes a sacramental theology. Um, what do you think of Lewis's view of Scripture? Did he have what we would consider a high view or a low view of Scripture? Well, Lewis doesn't really talk about Scripture very much. I mean, what you can do is you can find isolated quotes which you can bring together. But let me try and tease out what I think are the core themes. Uh, Lewis does not see Scripture as being a kind of primary foundation for the Christian faith. He sees the ways in which Christians interpret Scripture as being of major significance. And he says the right way of reading Scripture is to read it in company within the church. So we don't really find Lewis having a doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture. We don't really find Lewis engaging with Scripture all that much in his writings. The one book where he talks about Scripture is, of course, reflections on the Psalms. But very often, those reflections are, this is really difficult to understand. Let's see what we can do with it. So I think what I want to say is that uh, I think we need to supplement Lewis with people like John Stott or Billy Graham or whoever who really take Scripture very seriously. And what Lewis enables us to do is take our reading of Scripture and do some very good new things with it. Very good. I have heard it said that C.S. Lewis's reputation is very different in the U.S. than it is in Britain. He is admired more in the U.S. while the British are more skeptical of him. Is this true? And if so, why? Well, it is true. I mean, for you guys, C.S. Lewis is a rock star. 
Uh, you know, for, for us back in England, uh, he's a slightly quirky Oxbridge Don who wrote children's books and various things like that. And, and he doesn't really have the same high profile, but that may change this year because Lewis is being installed, or a memorial to Lewis is being installed in Westminster Abbey's Poets' Corner. And I think there may be something of a revival of public interest in Lewis as a result of this 50th anniversary. If, if someone has never read anything by C.S. Lewis, where should he start? And I'm gonna modify this. Let's start, I've got two nephews over there who are in high school, so figure 16, 17 years old. That age group, where would they start? I would still recommend The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, it's imaginatively very, very powerful. It's, in effect, it's very, very easy to understand. And it's one of these books that you will come back to 20 years later and actually see new things there. I have friends who had Narnia read to them as children, who've then read Narnia to their children, and as they read, they saw things they missed the first time round. All right, what if it's a 45-year-old uh, uh, person? What advice, which book would you start with that? I think I would still suggest Mere Christianity, even though I appreciate it is becoming dated, because it does give a very winsome presentation of the Christian faith. It opens up lots of good questions, and, I mean, it will lead you into others of Lewis's works. But you've got to start somewhere. You want to start with something that's articulate, that's clear, that's winsome, and Mere Christianity is a wonderful gateway into Lewis's wider body of writings. As I read this question, I'm reading this knowing that the gentleman to my left has written, I believe, some of the best books out there on orthodoxy and what Christian orthodoxy is and, and, and explaining it. So this is like in his wheelhouse, as we say. Um, was Lewis willing to suspend some of his more orthodox views for the good of the story? Maybe you know, Ransom's theory of atonement, accepting Tash worshipers, and I think that was the last battle. Uh, what, what would you say on that? I think there are points at which Lewis finds that narratives don't adequately convey the full richness of the Christian way of thinking. And thus, I would want to say that there are points at which I think Lewis conveys an aspect of the greater whole rather than the greater whole itself, and sometimes I'm slightly apprehensive about what he actually says. For example, in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there is there's the death of Aslan, but it's not about the salvation of everyone in Narnia. It's simply about one particular person being let off the hook. So I, I, think, I think you need to say that Lewis... You must feel free to challenge Lewis, even though I'm still saying there's a lot of very good stuff in his writings. Um, what story would you or Lewis use to explain in the 21st century justification? A loaded theological term. You challenge us to use stories. It puts you on the spot, but might you be able to come up with one? If I was put on the spot, uh, it would probably show what a lousy preacher I am uh, to try and um, find a story just to make this point. But certainly I'd want to tell a story which is that about, the, um, about someone who finds themselves in a place where they thought there was no hope, no way out, and then someone graciously does all that is necessary to change things utterly and leads them out. So I would use justification in a rich sense of the term, but I think it's still very possible to tell a story that really begins to unlock at least some of its aspects. Uh, in your preface, you say Lewis operated from the margins of religious life. He is a central figure now. Why? Well, I think one of the things I noticed very strongly when writing this is that um, Lewis today, for many people, has become a religious authority. In other words, someone who is trusted, someone who is consulted on matters of faith, and in doing so has displaced other people who might feel that they have that role. And I think it's important just to note that although Lewis very much wrote as a lay Anglican, 
his ideas in England, for example, would be given a lot more weight at certain points than, for example, the pronouncements of certain bishops. So he has actually become an authority figure, not because of his institutional authority, but rather because he's so trusted and respected and for that reason is taken so seriously. Last three questions, because we are out of time and there's lots of good ones. I'm sorry, I cannot get to. This, uh, this writer believes that N.T. Wright considers C.S. Lewis's apologetic method ineffective in our contemporary culture. You don't have to comment on how N.T. Wright sees C.S. Lewis, but what would you say uh, in regards to C.S. Lewis's apologetic method? I think C.S. Lewis's apologetic method involves reason, it involves imagination, it involves telling stories, it involves translation. And I have to say that if it is ineffective, then we are in real trouble because it remains one of the most effective that I can think of. I concede that each of its individual components might be vulnerable on its own, but I do think that taken together they give a very rich range of possibilities for those of us who are trying to engage with our culture. Uh, last two questions. Could you speak to the correct order of the Narnia books? And I'm not going to make you remember all seven of them, but uh, you, you would definitely start with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and end with The Last Battle. Well, I will tell you that uh, this is a debated question. But for me, uh, you would read them in the order of publication, okay? The order of publication. <laughs> Uh, and, and I hope there is no representative Harper Collins here, but I would say that the message they print in the collected edition is actually slightly misleading. Um, uh, the key point is you mustn't read The Magician's Nephew before The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe for the very simple reason that, you know, everything is introduced so gradually, so beautifully in The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. You don't know who Aslan is. But if you've read The Magician's Nephew first, you know quite a lot about Aslan. Now, see Magician's Nephew as something you read after The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe because you're wondering, how did Narnia come to be in this state? And uh, last question. It's a rather personal one, but I hope you won't mind asking. Um, how did you come to faith? How did you get saved? What, what? Well, I used to be an atheist, and... Uh, talking to Christian friends at Oxford and beginning to think things through in a very liberating intellectual environment, I just began to realize that atheism didn't actually make all that much sense and actually was imaginatively a little bit drab and dreary and began to realize I'd misunderstood Christianity and that if Christianity was what I now began to realize it was, then actually it was both very robust intellectually and exciting spiritually. So uh, I, I changed my mind quite radically. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.